You have said your brother's death in 2004, along with many former classmates, floats like a ghost in the studio with you and finds its way into your um, your work. But it wasn't until a couple of years ago that you took a more direct approach into dealing with that ghost when you started the hometown opioid portraits. Can you talk a little bit about what prompted this more direct look at the losses through portraits of those lost to addiction um, and how that compares to your other work? Yeah, the um, the new, the portraits, um, they just felt more direct because everybody understands a portrait. You know, it's more familiar. And the previous ways I had approached talking about, you know, my brother's death or just um, mortality in general was through like symbolism, uh, through landscape, through uh, art history references, things that are a bit more um, le- like less democratic. And so uh, originally when I did my first portrait for this opioid series, um, I didn't know it was going to be a series. I was just doing it for a friend who had reached out. And then after that, um, they were just so thankful that I you know, would do that for them for free that I just thought I should reach out to more people in my community, you know, from my hometown and see if that was something that they wanted to. And it was, and people were, you know, some of these people had been passed away for 20 years, 25 years. And just to have, just for them, I think it was important to have somebody just want to pay respect and also sort of memorialize them in a painting. It seemed to be an important thing, um, more so than I knew going into it. So I thought, well, portraits are a way that like everybody, like I said, understands a portrait, you know, before when I had done portraits, uh, maybe of my brother and things, there were usually like symbols layered into it and it became more complex, you know, more layers of translation to get misconstrued as to what it's about. And I also, I wasn't necessarily trying to talk about it directly. You know, I was talking about my own fear of mortality too, through referencing you know, him and, and other and other people. And so this was just, I wanted it to be as clear as possible and as pure as possible. And so that's, that's how this series started. And to that, could you talk, t- just tell me a little bit about your brother, um, just who he was and just anything about him? Yeah, sure. Um, he was my uh, stepbrother actually, but my parents got married. They got married um, when we were both about seven years old. And uh, we were the closest in age. He was a year younger than me. We were about the same height. A lot of people actually thought we were twins um, because we we kind of, maybe we didn't look so much alike in the face, but we just had a very similar sense of humor. And like I, in the middle school, I was voted, I was one year above him, but I was voted like best sense of humor. And then he had a, another category that was um, the wittiest boy category. And he won that one. So it was like this weird thing that we were sort of these kindred spirits, even though we weren't blood related, you know, but we grew up together. And um, uh, yeah, just a really funny guy and was just always like the most popular, you know, kid in school. Um, you know, he was sort of the cool kid and I was like in the peripheral. I was friends with everybody, but um, but yeah, just to, yeah, give you the shirt off your back kind of guy too, so. And then I'm going to ask you one more question, which is one thing I noticed about the portraits is that the series is a very, they have a very gestural quality to them. They're very, they look very quick and, and and fluid. But when you spend more time with them, there's small little details. You put like little earrings or you like carve in little the eyelashes or headband elements. Um, and when I'm just wondering when people reach out to you to have their loved ones painted for this series, how do the details of the stories that they tell you about those loved ones kind of play into the, the painting or their time in the studio painting those portraits. So, so to me, those two things, the details in the painting, but also the detail of someone's story, that conversation that you might have had or email, um, seem to connect. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting balance that I'm trying to achieve. Um, I do the portraits almost always in the morning before too many things have flooded into my like day to to like either cause outside distractions and stress and I really like I know whose portrait I'm going to paint that day because I have 
sort of a backlog of, of messages and Facebook mostly and stories. And, I, and I'll re, read through those. And then, but yeah, the fluidity of the mark making, sometimes one will just come out really quickly, which is great. But sometimes, you know, I am also, I want it to look like the person enough, you know, um, I don't know that person, uh, the photos, I mean, a lot of people, I don't, a lot of them I don't know, you know, but I'm trying to capture the, just the feeling of the pic, the photographs they've sent me and, and then using the stories that they've told me, you know, sometimes there's like sorrow underneath, you know, that they've, a battle that's been, on, you know, that they were struggling with for 20 years or something and they relapsed. And, um, there's, there's certain things where like, you know, and I am just like looking at the photo and being like, what are the undertones of this person's pigment, you know, and, and doing that as a base layer. And, but I try to keep, I purposely try to keep the mark making pretty fluid to sort of represent both to put life back into this person, to make there be movement in them with the color and the, and the brushwork. And then also to, to like speak towards my own personal, uh, I guess the the way I'm trying to make the the marks to represent a, a hurried. I'm thinking about the the rush towards the grave, and I'm like thinking about you know if I guess the like a lot of the masters they would do like I mean some people only did like ten paintings in their lifetime because they were so captured you know so wrapped up in the details, and so I think I'm trying to like show that these are made with haste because life is so short, and so I think that. For me, the mark making is sort of an echo of I don't have a lot of time here to capture this insurmountable amount of people, you know, that just keeps growing every day. And so that's I think that's the details that I just choose to leave out are because of that process. And then also things like just things that stick out, you know, almost like in a caricature, like, you know, this person's wearing a headband and they'll usually send me the people, the loved ones that send me the pictures, usually send me a few pictures. If I see a ha headband on this person in every picture, then like that, I'll probably put a headband, you know, that's sort of their trademark. Or if they wear a ball cap, you know, if they're a sports fan and they have a ball cap in the photo, that's probably the photo I'm going to use, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if their eyelashes are just really strikingly long, you know, like a brother had really long eyelashes. Uh, there's like things like that where I'm just trying to pick and choose what's the defining characteristic that will get me there enough and not be super specific. So you mentioned that your work is attempting to visually capture the idea that memory is intangible and oftentimes distorted. How do you think the process of the weaving and unweaving and then using the dye to color the images, how do you think that plays into the idea? I think that is... So I'm, I'm, I'm actually very process driven in my work. Um, I get really wrapped up in process. And I think with weaving a fabric and unweaving it and then reweaving it and also the, the dye work itself, it's similar to watercolors, very fluid. It, it just doesn't stay, fabric is, is shifts. Um, and so it, it just kind of the way when you when you remember someone, each time you're remembering them, you're you're connecting those little like snaps of things going on in your brain, all that stuff. And so each time the memory changes just a little bit and it starts to connect to new memories. So I think that the process creates a shift in the image that it is something that's recognizable, but it's blurry. And so the further away you are, the more focus it has, the more you try to go into it and look at it and see what it is, you start to lose that focus. And it's the, I think that's sometimes the same way with with memory and memories of people is you, you start to lose that person or lose a sense of sometimes a person when you're getting into, when you spend too much time thinking on them. I don't know if that, that's very clear. No, I think that that makes sense. And it's similar to the what I was saying as well with those, that's why they work so well together. Uh, yeah, that it's sort of a, the story of a story, you know, and it's the sort of like telephone where it gets changed a little bit, but it's the overall feel is there, you know, of the story. But um, I think that's I think they're really successful though. In the in that, the more I learned about the process, the more it made so much sense to me. And but speaking of that process, did you try other things 
other techniques or methods before you sort of landed on this particular process? No, my undergraduate degree is in fiber material studies, and I particularly clung to weaving or an affinity to weaving. So I I knew that I wanted to make my work, I knew my work needed to be weaving. Um, And then the the figuring out how to make the weaving do what I wanted to do came second, came second to the process or to the work, which is a very, I think is a very strange maybe thing to do. Um, But then again, I think of painters, I mean, you're a painter, you're a painter because you're a painter. I'm a weaver in some ways because I'm just a weaver. So it's, it's making the medium bend to what you want it to do. Um, I didn't explore other processes or mediums. It's, it's now that I'm starting to explore, delve into ceramics a little bit with other pieces and then also exploring, um, other ways of using textiles that aren't woven. So it's, it's, it's kind of been the opposite for me. That's really interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed that. So that's, uh, I feel like that's unique in the way that you, you knew the the technique or the the medium. And then you were like, how do you, it's sort of like just working with what you have already. I was watching your, your video earlier a few times and just really trying to understand. I didn't realize that you would do the weaving and then, and then undo it all and then, and then redo it. And, and that just causes like inconsistencies or like or a shifting and a blurring. That's so interesting to me because it is similar to painting in that sometimes I'll make a precise, more precise painting. And then I'll take like something and just sort of sand it off, like the whole thing off to make it blurry, you know. And so like underneath there's a or, or, or I'll like do it just like a um, like a light, like a, a light glazing over the whole thing that moves the still wet pigment and charcoal and things. To give it, it kind of smears like, it down or shifts shifts it, mm-hmm. and then yeah, and then to to give it that more ethereal, like misremembered idea, you know, which is similar. I think um, we're just going about it two different ways. Yours is very precise and clean, and mine's I'm you know spilling stuff on the floor. But but it was really interesting to watch that like over and over and just kind of try to understand it a little more. So similar to my home, hometown opioid portraits, your work dealing with your personal family history has led to a wider focus and exploration of other people's stories with similar topics. Uh, why do you feel it's important to shine light on these missing people and families? It's something that, again, again, I think it comes from that personal family stories and, and history that it, it I was always focusing on my family, but that gets boring for an audience to look at just like, me like my me my it's it's very self-focused um so for me exploring it outwardly and looking at other people's losses and other people's experiences with that started it just expanded naturally that way but also I think it also allows me personally to understand my own personal story a little more by looking at other people's have you always had an interest in history and genealogy and research and that sort of thing? Yes, I've always been interested in history. I took every history class available to me in high school. I just, I don't know, always had an interest in history and genealogy. I've always been interested in it, although I didn't know that's what it was when I was little. I just used to ask the older family members stories and like ask about different people and what it was like before and who like asked them stories about their grandparents and so it just was an order like a natural um thing I don't know why why I have a curiosity towards that so yeah it's always always kind of been there yeah I think you've done like a really interesting job of merging something that could potentially be boring to a lot of people you know to make it such a like a very it's super interesting like your work and the way that you your like commitment to the research and like going to archives and all that, just all those little minute, the minute details that you're like interested in. It never seems boring to me, like from what I've, the conversations we've had. So do you ever contact the families of the missing people or any, with any discoveries you've made? I have only reached out to one person and that's because 
they had reached out on Reddit to the general community wanting more information. Um, but I have not. And the reason I do not reach out to people is because in my own family, there's people that don't want to talk about things. It's sometimes it's too painful to talk about. Um, and you don't know when you're reaching out to someone where they sit with that and how that can affect them. So I have not recalled, called, like reached out to any family members, just one who was already clearly seeking information. And so it felt that felt appropriate. But otherwise, I have not. That makes sense. Yeah. I have noticed that in your, I'm not sure if it's more, your more recent work, I've noticed that you incorporate text and layered designs into some of your pieces. Is that a new development? Yeah, I would say that's within the last few years, I started looking um, at the use of just one or two words. It's normally words that kind of echo through my head when I work on the portraits. And so that just started coming into the pieces the pieces with words that are in the show that our show together are smaller and so those were done at the end of the warp um so when I'm working you have only so much length that you can work and I like to give myself a little wiggle room at the end so that means I can normally fit a small piece in but it's not big enough to do a portrait and so that's where the w words um have started to come in is just using that space and putting the words in there. And then as far as the, I noticed a few of the pieces have like a design element that almost looks like it's layered over top of. Um, are those any specific, are they like regional uh, patterns or? No, it's just what feels right. To, I don't know, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's, it's like, a, it's, like a, it's not as simple as a gestural mark because it's a very regimented process. But to create it, but it's my way of putting a gestural mark on an image um, through weaving or marks that just kind of, to me, relate to the portrait. Or, I don't know, it's, it's a, something that I don't quite have words for or understand, but if I was just straight painting the person or painting the image, I think I would have those marks layered on top, additional marks. You know, to me, they seem like similar to the words, they add sound to the pieces, which, you know, memory is obviously, sound is a big part of that, of course, smell and things like that. But to me, they add a rhythm in the way that like chatter would, you know, or something. Um, so I think that they, they work really well with the the, sta the still image, you know, to add another layer of, of storytelling, really. Yeah, the, the, I think there's something about the it being a layer on top of or distortion or obscuring part of the image yeah i like to think of it as like i do these things in my paintings where i call them in my head i call them like visual static to just sort of add a little bit of like a, a stutter in the piece to uh, and so i'm obviously seeing that through my own lens when i'm looking at your work is that like the retelling of a story is maybe those are like a blip in like a memory where it's like something's there's a missing piece of like information or something yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's right on point. And I think I think that's what I see in both our work is there's um but this particular body of both our works, there's this nice relationship of conversation between the two in the softness or the blurriness, the the out of focus um memory of people, the the but there's also a weight of loss that sits sits in the air um, over the portraits or the paintings. Yeah, there's an imprecision in the mark making, be it weaving or, or you know, inking or, and yet they're very much solid in space forms that are, that are intentional in commemorative qualities, uh, which I think for me, when I was doing the portraits, people, I think to see their, their loved ones displayed on a gallery wall or in a museum, uh, to hold them, to, to have something like the opioids where there's so much shame and stigma surrounding that topic. And I'm sure like there's a lot of that is probably similar in some ways for like missing people and, and things with their family histories and, and the, comp the complexities of all that and the familial relationships all get, you know, 
it's stressful on everybody involved. So I think that our work does sort of speak well to each other and then to the idea of of imprecision in memory, but the need to try to make something exist as more than just a memory, as more of a, an actual object that shows attention to these often overlooked uh, topics. Yeah, I, uh, I think that that's, I would agree with that very much. Um, it's there also like little memorials to people. Um, and there's, you know, I reflect on the idea of the hair jewelry, you know, about the hair jewelry memorials that people used to do. The Victorian era, people used to take um, hair from their loved ones and braid them into these beautiful images, drawing like the flowers. So relating to your other work of, of floral um, paintings that you sometimes do that kind of come from some of these ideas, that ghost of mortality that hangs over your work, um, people would use hair. And so there's this sense of memorial, I think, to the pieces, these portraits. And I also see that in your other bodies of work. 